Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Strange Dead Fellows. With me, as always, is Mr. Keith Cookie Cookies. Hello. How are you, dear? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm just peachy. I'm curious, though. What are we going to talk about today? Oh, it's I, I'm I'm not really that excited at all. Um, yeah. I'm kind of bummed out, actually. Uh, facts. I'm geeking out about today's guest. Today, John E.L. Tenney is here, folks. He's one of the most sought-after investigators of strange phenomena. Everything from anomalistic phenomena, conspiracies, the occult, folklore, and way too many other things to even fathom. He's been a go-to consult. <laughs> fathom. Fathom. He's been a go-to consult for a and &E, the Discovery Channel, and many others. And the dude's just fucking hilarious. Please welcome John E. L. Tenney. Hey, hey, everybody. Hey. hey. There he is. There How I am. I am doing well. It's a wonderful day in Michigan. It's actually like 60 degrees out. I know, oh, wow. right? I'm just across the pond from you. I'm in Wisconsin. Across the pond. <laughs> <laughs> the great inland sea. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, better, you we... know what? Arkansas, you know, I have winter and tornadoes in the same week. So, right. That goes, at least. That's just batshit crazy. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy. But no, it's but, great here. It's it's nice and warm, and I just went on a walk. And uh, I know no, the sun sent out today. Today, I, like, I think it's the first day that I've actually noticed that some of the grass looks green. Yeah, for sure. There was a squirrel on my back deck that I if I mean I psychically maybe was reading his mind, but he looked at me as if to say, "Fucking finally." <laughs> <laughs> Even the animals are like, oh. Ooh. Yeah, they're oh. done. Spring. Yep. So now that we have you here, is there anything that is off limits to talk about? I don't have any secrets. The only thing that I don't talk about, and I'll tell you why I don't talk about it, even though I'll talk about it now, is <laughs> so in... In 1999, I got asked by the Vatican to sit in on an exorcism. So I got to see a, a Holy See-sanctioned exorcism. And it's the only time I've ever got in trouble for talking about something. I was on, when Ghost Stalkers, the show I was on in 2014, came out, we had to do this like news beat thing where you like go to all the different news stations and talk about things and so i was on a news channel uh, uh i think it was a fox affiliate somewhere and the woman somehow had asked me about it she had heard about it or read about me going to an exorcism oh, wow. and i started talking at length about it well at the in 99 at the end of the exorcism that was over i had to sign a non-disclosure agreement with the vatican to not talk about what i had experienced and the clients and all that type of stuff. Yeah. But I started talking about it on this Fox affiliate. And I mean, obviously this is 15 years later almost. Mm -hmm. And like two days later, I got a call from the archdiocese in Michigan. And they were like, you know, you're not supposed to be talking about this, right? And I was like, oh shit. Like non-disclosure agreements with minor TV networks and things like that. Big deal. Yeah. Like I'll break those in a heartbeat. But, like, when you have one with the Vatican, like, they actually have money and power. Like, yeah. maybe I shouldn't be talking about this <laughs> on national television. Oh, Hearing oh, NDA and Vatican in the same sentence is enough to just kind of be like, you know what? I'm, we're, yeah, we're, it's like, I'm good. Wrong. Not going to mess with that. That's but right. I, still, I still talk about it. I talk about the experience. I think that I figured out now over the years, like, the things I'm supposed to say and not supposed to say. I'll mm -hmm. tell you right now what I'm not supposed to say. Uh, so at the end of the exorcism near the end, it was about 32 hours. The whole thing took place oh and God. near the end, the client started speaking what seemed to me to be Chinese, but it ended up being what I found out was Mandarin. The assisting priest who was in the room 
went to the door and whispered something to the priests out in the hallway. And about a half an hour later, they brought a Buddhist monk in. And the Buddhist monk was translating and assisting with the exorcism. So oh. after the experience was over, and we had this kind of breakdown, breakout session where we sat around, I sat with the priest and the assisting priest and the, the monk and some, some other people that were there. I asked the, the main priest who had been performing the exorcism, I said, because we, you know, any questions were on the table. I said, isn't it strange that like you were doing a Catholic exorcism and you brought a Buddhist monk in to help? Like that just seems very odd to me. Right. And he looked, at, he looked at me, the assisting priest looked at me, the Buddhist monk looked at me, like everybody that was there that was kind of in the know all kind of smirked and kind of murmured. And the main priest looked at me and he said, listen, if you think that the major religions of the world don't understand that this is just one thing that we're calling different names, then you're wrong. And I said, why don't you tell that to people? And he said, right. no one, yeah. he said, no one would believe us. And I think that's what they're afraid of me saying when I go on television shows, because it is super mm -hmm. controversial to people, right? Oh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, and you think about just the cornerstone of, of every religion being built on that generally monotheistic. Yes. Like, all powerful. All You, know, you break them down. They have the same basic elements to them. Yeah, and the power structure, right, of those religions is that like exactly. we're the we're the right one. Yeah. We're the ones who know. Like if they were like, actually, we don't really know, but we all agree on it, like this one thing, like all yeah. of a sudden all those power structures start to fall apart. Mm-hmm. Who are you gonna tithe to every week if it's all just exactly. going to the same guy? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh. How am I gonna keep my doors open if you decide the Buddhist place is cheaper and quicker? Like, right. Like and, yeah. And, yeah. and if you are in essence, all worshiping the same God, how are you ever going to fight anybody about which, who's right? I was just going to say that there, there goes their righteous excuse to have wars and stuff and fight over things. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Politics. Mm -hmm. So there you go. That's what, that's what I can't talk about. <laughs> right, we, didn't, we don't even know what you said. Everyone forgot already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, I have I have one that I've been wanting to ask you because I've never really heard the full extent of of your story about um, my understanding was that you you had a near death experience or actually literally died um, when you were younger. And that's kind of what opened you up to just the paranormal in general, the interest and in all of that. Or were you interested before then? How did all that kind of play about? Yeah, it's it's a weird um, uh, I mean, I think with a lot of us, there are, is just a kind of swirling miasma cacophony of events. I was always, I always loved weird kid, weird kid stuff and monster stuff and superheroes. And I loved reading about UFOs and Bigfoots and ghosts when I was young. And I don't, I'm not one of those people that has a story that I saw a ghost when I was three years old or was abducted by aliens when I was four. I uh, I was just a punk rock kid in Michigan that just hated people telling me what I was supposed to think about. And, you know, they told me, don't think about UFOs and ghosts and Bigfoot and those things. So I just read more and more about them. Uh, and then I started dating a girl when I was 15 or 16 who said she had a ghost in her house. And, and she was like, you're the only person I know who can, like, do something. So I went to her house, did a very horrible, rudimentary ghost hunt. This was probably 1980. 485. I mean, just white candles and I had a Bible and said some prayers and whatever. Mm -hmm. right. But that was like the first time I was like, oh, this is a thing that people do. Like if you have ghosts in your house, you ask someone to get the ghost out or talk oh, to the yeah. ghost like that, right? It was this mind blower for me. And I think that that mm -hmm. time, even the movie Ghostbusters had only been out like a year. Like if you can wrap your brain around that, like the yeah. consciousness of the universe was still like Ghostbusters is a new thing. Yeah. Uh, but when I was 18, uh, I had a heart attack, which, you know, is uncommon, but anybody can have a heart attack. It's something that can happen. You can just go into, you know, a, a AFib situation and have a heart attack. <clears throat> so I, I, I did die uh, when the, paramedics got to my house um they uh shocked me back 
And then I died once again, and then they chemically started my heart. Uh, but all in all, about three and a half minutes down. Um, oh, wow. And so with, with death experiences, you have typically three uh, main experiences that happen with people. Um, mm-hmm. Well, the, the fourth, which is the most common, is people just don't have an experience at all. That's the most common, is nobody, people just don't have an experience. Mm-hmm. But the three most common near near death or death experiences, one is, uh, you know, a tunnel of light and balloons and all your loved ones and puppies and everybody loves you and they want you to come over. Like, that's the one you hear about the most uh-huh. because it's the most kind of glorious and happy and not difficult to talk about. It's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The second one that you'll hear the most commonly is that people know that they they somehow know that they were dead. And they are usually watching their body, either from above or a part of the room. They'll see the doctors working on themselves. They'll be on the ceiling of the ambulance looking down at the people working on them. They have an out-of-body experience. Right. The third experience, which is mine, is called a null experience or a void experience. And, And it's difficult to talk about because you experience nothingness. You experienced the void. And the reason it's difficult to talk about is because in the void, there are not words. So for me to try and explain it makes it into something and it is nothing. So when I tell you like my first experience in the void was trying to scream because I realized I was in nothing. But then I realized like I didn't have a throat. I didn't have a voice. I didn't have hands. I didn't have a brain that could make a thought to scream. So like, it sounds, it, 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 it's really hard to put into words that experience. And since you're not that, since there's nothing in nothing, since you, even you are the nothing as well, right. there's no time. So you're also there for an infinite amount of time, which again, makes it difficult to discuss, to discuss because me talking to the both of you right now, for me, this moment in time is after forever. Like I was in an infinite amount of time and an infinite amount of time has no end. And yet somehow I am now past that. So I, I am now in after forever. <laughs> if you... John, look that number one. Oh I love, God. I love this. Like I, I truly do. It's um, I've never, I have not heard about the nothing before. The, yeah, the I haven't heard anyone weeks, talk about it like that. The last few <laughs> weeks, I've been losing my shit down these like explaining and understanding time rabbit holes, and then you just threw that at me. So I'm thanking you for the next week of my life. Just thinking that I'm like, that's what we just recorded was a thing on time and time travel and these concepts and our brains hurting from thinking about it. And then you said that and we're both just like. It's it's yeah, just I, a, you're in a contradictory yeah. thing where you've experienced something that you weren't there for that can't be experienced. Yeah. And I guess my my takeaway from it now that I'm I've had time to process the experience of being dead or what I experienced, what I call being dead and and being in the void. When I think about it now, it reinforces the idea that, you know, human beings love dualistic systems, right and wrong, hot and cold, black and white, day and night. We love those things because they're very simple, categorizable. Here's the one thing. Here's the opposite thing. Right. And so when it comes to time, Um, you know, you have past and future and obviously the present is the now moment, but the universe is an infinite variety of rights and wrongs and yeses and nos and shades of color. And so what, what my experience reinforced to me is even the concept of time has an infinite variety of experiences of time. Some of those we we witness in our everyday lives, right? Like most people had a class in high school that they hated, and somehow that class was longer than all the classes, all the other classes. Like it wasn't, it was the right. exact same amount of time, right? It felt somehow, way longer, yeah. 
for me, it was any math class, right? Like every class was 50 oh, minutes yes. long, except my math class somehow was two fucking hours long. Like, how is it not going by? <laughs> But my art class only was 15 minutes. Like yes, I sat down with my pencils together and now it was time to fucking go. Yeah. So time is obvious. It seems very fluidic in, in how we can perceive it and how we can understand it. And it also seems that forever is, I mean, it's a construct that we've created the idea of forever. So maybe there is an after forever. Uh, doing some ghost hunts. I actually talk about my experience sometimes when I'm doing EVP sessions. Mm -hmm. I'll say things like, are you in the forever? Or are you after the forever? Like, I'll say that thing. And honestly, it blows my mind when I get responses to those questions that the entities that seem to be responding to me seem startled that I'm using th those terms that you know yes. that you're like aware of that. Oh, yeah. wow. And I've even experienced in certain situations, I've talked about this a couple of times with like Amy Bruni and, and Adam Berry. And, mm -hmm. and uh, like, sometimes I feel like in certain situations, ghosts, entities, spirits, whatever you want to call them, become uncomfortable with me when I start talking about that other place. And it's almost as if being dead leaves a kind of stink on you, if for lack of a better words, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. that the dead can pick up. And they're like, oh, that fucking guy was where we are, but now he's back where they are. Why did he get mm. to do that? Mm. That's a lot, man. I, yeah, it so, is. Have you ever had anyone reply that they are in the nothing? Because that's one that would blow my mind. Yes. How, yeah. how do they hear that and respond? Yeah. That's I had, a paradoxical, like. Right. Yeah. I had a EVP session. This is probably about five years ago. And one of my questions was, are you in the for forever? Are you in forever? And. The response was yes. And this was back with cassette recorder. So I had to listen back later. So I wasn't hearing it live in the moment. And the answer was yes. And I said, if you're in the forever, can you tell me, is everyone in the forever? And then the response came back on the EVP. It said, everyone is always in forever. And so then... I was like, oh, so like, I'm still there too. Everybody in this room is there because at some point in the future, we're going to die. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then right. we're in the forever and then we have access to the forever, which so like that brings up and I've talked about this. I'm sure you guys have talked about this too. Like when we're talking or doing ghost investigations, like how many times are we just talking to ourself? Mm -hmm. like, my investigation. When I investigate a location and I get all these really crazy responses, I, I know that I have been in that location in the future. So if I die in the future and want to talk to myself or if I want something to happen to me, why wouldn't I go back to where I know I was and say the things I want to hear so that I can advance myself on the way that I want to advance myself? Right. Fucking hate you. Oh. Oh, <laughs> he, I uh, told well, you, I'm like, he's got like the coolest mind. It's well, talking about awesome. the time stuff, like when she yeah. and I were talking, I'm obsessed with it, like here lately, just completely obsessed with it and what all it could mean with it being, you know, fluid, non linear, like as a location as opposed to a when, it's a where. Right. Um, right. And I, you know, you hear the thing about like your life flashes before your eyes when you die. It makes me wonder if our future also flashes before our eyes. Like if, if I went tomorrow and it wasn't technically my time, but I jumped ahead, would I be able to see the rest of what my life was supposed to be mm -hmm. since so, time is. So I'll tell you this, this is just my personal experience. And when I talk about the, my, my death experience, when I hear people say your life flashes before your eyes, I think that, because of the way we interact and talk with each other and phrase phrases catch on and people use certain phrases for me, 
when I hear that right before you die, your life flashes before your eyes. That's not how I experienced it when I had my death experience. The way that I understand that phrase is when you die, you have just seen your whole life, right? You've just lived. Right. And, and the moment before you die, you realize that it's just been a flash that in the billions of years of existence in the entirety and unfoldment of the universe, whether it's 10 years, 20, 50, 70, 80, a hundred years that you've lived right. in the moment before you die, you realized I have only been a flash and you just saw it. And it's going to seem all of this, our conversation right now, everything you've ever done is going to seem like it was just a second ago. Just a little blip. Yeah. I don't know if it's an actual just replay. I don't think it is a replay. I think we're in the flash right now. Maybe like a realization of how insignificant our time actually was yeah. in the big picture. Wow. Yeah. 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 That yeah. This sense. is the flash. I mean, I mean, at some, like at some point, again, like I said, at some point in our future, we're going to die. Right. Mm -hmm. And this moment that's happening right now is going to seem not like it was 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago. It's going to seem like it was oh, just a second ago. I was talking to Tenny about this. Like yeah. at the moment that you die 30 years from now, 50 years from now, and it's going to be gone in a flash. Wow. Yeah. Mm. It makes sense. So be nice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't be a dick. It's over really fast. I'll just yeah, you fill out. <laughs> you don't want you don't want that flash to be filled with a whole bunch of horrible shit and be like, oh, god. oh my god, yeah, like, like what we talked about before we were recording with freezing certain things. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. Oh yeah, lord, that's, that's going to be in there for all of us now. <laughs> yep, that's not an easy thing to forget. No, but oh, back to lord. the idea of uh, investigating ourselves. If you know, so I am, I love collecting and compiling data and, and unfortunately, I mean, obviously people who hunt ghosts and do paranormal research, we love to talk about data and information collection and getting machines to gather data for us, but we're really bad at a, as a community in like coalescing that data together. Like if we really wanted endless data about a certain location. Let's say, let's, I'm just going to take Waverly Hills because it's a big place that people go to all the time. Someone is almost always investigating Waverly. Like right now, I'm sure there's people right. investigating Waverly. If we kept good notes and we shared them with each other, by now we would have this whole chain of which day is most active. Like if everybody wrote down at four o'clock on Thursday, and then we looked back through the books, we might be able to find patterns, patterns right? Patterns, exactly, yeah. Right. But we don't keep very good records and we don't share them very much with each other and whatever. But yeah. to the point of investigating ourselves, I think that if you look at notoriously, allegedly haunted locations, if you look way back, turn of the century, 1800s, the traditional hauntings that you hear about that people that kind of sparked uh, psychical research and paranormal research. They always talk about like shadowy figures moving in the darkness, whispering in low voices, strange lights floating around in the darkness. It seems very much to me like it is very possible that those people in the past are experiencing paranormal investigators in the future in that location. It's us walking around in the dark, whispering in low voices, saying, can you hear me? Can you talk to me? Flashlights and K2 meters and the lights floating around in the room. And someone in the 1800s is like, this fucking place is haunted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. That's it's very possible. Oh my God. I actually, um, I've been writing a book for the better part of 15 years and never finishing it. But I, I came so up with a different idea for a story. Um, my best friend and I, uh, when we first met 20 years ago, we started investigating together. And um, I came up with a story idea where over time, some of these big events that we experienced together during our investigations and before we met each other, all of that, it starts to unravel that it was us as older adults 
doing it yeah. to ourselves as children and when we were together in our 20s and so on and so forth. And to hear that type of concept, it just, I don't know, it. there's synchronicities with everything. Lindsay always says it. And that's another one of those things that if so many people, if this mindset, this collective consciousness that we have that people never really tap into keep having these same ideas and concepts about certain things. There has to be some kind of validity to it somewhere. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's, what's really wonderful is a lot of people get mad when, especially because of social media and the way things are now, or people will be like, uh, someone will just start investigating whether it's UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, whatever. Someone will, will start their journey. And because of social media, like, a whole group of people who have done it for five years will jump on that new person and be like, you don't know what you're doing. And yeah. like then people who have done it for 10 years, jump on the people who are five years who are like, you don't know what you're doing. And like, nobody knows what they're doing. Like, let's exactly. like, that. And no one hops in and is like, Oh, do you have any questions or do you want some advice on like suggestions on whatever? Like, right. There's no helpful. It's yeah. But crazy. like you, but, but the thing is, is and what's interesting, and like you were saying, it's amazing to watch whether it's through someone's new journey or someone's extended journey through the paranormal and the supernatural, when you see them pop into an idea that you had, even if that idea was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And there is this, obviously, there's this thing where people are like, well, I was the first person who thought of that. But it's like, right. no, 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 you don't understand. We're all getting to a point where we think about it. Like, that's the interesting part of it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there are things, obviously, like, I've written things down, too, and been like, this is, like, the smartest thing I ever thought up. And then, like, right. I go and I read a book from, like, 1950, and there's, you know, a 60-year-old guy thought of it and wrote it in a book in 1950. <laughs> and I'm like, motherfucker. Like, <laughs> like... But coming to that, like, and then you realize, oh, no, that's that's part of the journey is coming yeah. up with the idea and then being able to say, like, I got to that point. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm here now. I'm completely buried in the weirdness with the rest of you. Yeah. It's that oh. evolution of our of our collective consciousness. It's, yes. you know, spirituality, experiences, science, education, all of that plays a factor into it. And as we evolve, the way that we think and the dots that we try to connect start to evolve that way too, which has always made me wonder, do we manifest the things that we think are possibilities? Mm -hmm. You know, that's right. the other side of it. It's just, what if there is no paranormal, but we have manifested that because of our limited understanding as a group right. about what happens when we die or how time works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just, it's a lot. I could and go you on find, about that forever. The other thing that I find too is, you know, it's not just in the paranormal. The thing that like I'm a big fan of like classic films and mm -hmm. uh, I read a lot of comic books and old fiction. And the thing that always kind of breaks my brain is that people who have no interest in paranormal phenomena, some people who are vehement, especially if this happens a lot in science fiction, people who are like vehement skeptics who are just these absolute cynics, but they're going to write science fiction because that's fiction and whatever. They will, in their fiction, in their art, in their music, in their dance, like even skeptics get to a point where they start manifesting the same ideas that paranormalists have. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, you're writing. There's a, a, a British author. He ended up being a screenwriter named Nigel Neal, who in the 1950s and 60s and 70s wrote a lot of BBC television. Mm -hmm. And Nigel Neal didn't believe in anything supernatural. He wrote nothing but science fiction and supernatural fiction, but didn't believe in any of it. And if you read mm -hmm. Nigel Neal's works and watch his television shows from the 50s and 60s, his influence in the paranormal, I, I did the, a little video on this uh, on TikTok, but Nigel Neal, yeah, ridiculous. The way you said it, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but Nigel Neal in 1971 had wrote this movie that got showed in the BBC and it was called the stone tape. And it was about how buildings can contain the essence of a ghost. And so there's this television show from 1972 
about paranormal investigators using reel-to-reel tapes and heat sensors left on stairs so they can see where a ghost is walking as it changes the the, the air temperature and how the crystalline structure <clears throat> the crystalline structure of the granite of the building somehow contains a recording and it's like this skeptic came up with the exact idea that of a residual haunting exactly. without without being with being a skeptic and not thinking any of it is real and he still came up with the exact same idea yeah and Which that actually as you're saying that i'm like that's obviously that's residual like yeah energy and it just yeah, yeah. i didn't mean to cut you off lens i'm sorry oh no it's fine um it that just makes me think about um all of the different artists whether musicians or painters or whatever um if they have a certain like a certain piece or work that they're known for the most. Um, and a lot of them will say it practically wrote itself or made itself. And they don't even really remember doing that. And had this concept of um, artsy people just being more sensitive and being channels for this stuff. And if we're all tapping into the same thing, I mean, yeah, it makes absolutely. sense. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I've talked about this at my lectures sometimes. So exactly what you just said, Lindsay. Like, I I play guitar, and there have been an uncountable amount of times over the forty years that I've played guitar where I start playing something, and I have no idea where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Like the chords are there, the formation is there, the tones are there, and they're just coming to me. And you'll hear people say that it just came to me. Yeah. Um, when they write poetry, when they write songs, when they paint, it's just coming to me. It's coming from somewhere. And so yeah. it's like the weirdness of the universe figures out a way to manifest in your brain, whether you're a skeptic or not, it wants to reveal itself. And so it does so through these weird, mysterious mechanisms that we sometimes just call inspiration. Yes, exactly. And I was, oh, I think I talked to you about this recently, Keith. Um, because sometimes every once in a while, if someone comes to me for advice or something, I'll, I'll, I'll find myself saying all of this crap to them. And then you're kind of like, where the fuck did that come from? Yeah, <laughs> That sounded way smarter than anything I know. And, and, so like, and you way, know too, you're... way too accurate on top <laughs> of it. No, I get that. It's like I've always likened those moments to, I've told you this before, when I had the time stuff. Yeah. Like in, in Billy Madison, where our, um, not Billy Madison, old school, where, where they're having like the contest at the end, and Farrell like goes into this trance and gives this amazing fucking answer. And then he's like, oh, I blacked out. What happened? Like it's yes. that same type of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, man. And, and, and uh, I talk about a lot in my lectures, like, it's so embedded into us that we don't even realize it anymore. Whether like, I think language is very important in the words that we use and knowing where those words come from, but like even the word inspire, like it means in the spirit, like when you are inspired to write music, the spirit has taken you, you have become inspired in the breath of the universe, right? In inspire. Yeah. And so like, even that concept of, of being in touch with spirits, like when people say, oh, I was inspired and you, they just throw it off at the bar, right? They don't realize they've just literally said to you, yeah. like, I was, I was channeling a spirit of the universe. <laughs> That's something that I love so much about your work too, is you break down so many words and their historical, like where it started and what it actually means and what people are actually saying. And like, I didn't know inspire meant in spirit. And I mean, it, after you said it, it's like, well, duh. And mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right it's it's it super awesome. crazy that's uh there was a someone on twitter recently and they were talking about uh have you ever been cursed and so like the word curse so so back in the 1700s when the church was starting to kind of lose its power in england and in europe uh mm -hmm. people would go to the kind of older uh mostly women who were magic practitioners to uh, have a, a change of course. They, so they were going to magic, what we would call witches. They would go to these women at the edge of town and they would ask, how can you change my life? Like I'm, I'm going outside of the church. 
and they would do spells for them. They would tell them what to you know drink and what to do with the moonlight and which day to right. do this. So the church started calling those curses. Now you would go to those women for a curse specifically. A curse mm -hmm. wasn't a bad thing. Talking about etymology, curse means it comes from Latin. It means current. It means the current of a river. And when you would go to a woman for a curse or you would go to a magic practitioner for a curse, you were literally asking them, please change the direction of my life. It wasn't a negative thing. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Sure. The mm -hmm. church was like, we're the only people that can tell you how to run your life. We're the yeah. only people that can tell you what to do. It's a bad thing if someone curses you. And so when someone on Twitter was like, has anyone ever cursed you? The reality, etymologically, if I think about it, has anyone ever helped me change the direction of my life? Yeah, of course. Like, what a wonderful thing that has been yeah. sometimes for people to change the, the direction. The church wants their monopoly on it, though. Yeah, right. exactly. They, want, they don't yeah, they want people to have options. Yeah, they want you to think it's a bad thing, when in mm -hmm. reality, it's just, I'm helping you change the direction of your life. It's not that. In reality, it's a gift. Yeah. Oh, man. So, okay. With your lectures, I was lucky enough to be able to go to one last year, and it was awesome. What For you, what's the best part of being able to do your weird lectures? Mm, that's a good question. I like more than anything... I like talking to people afterward. I think that's the best part of my lectures. Like I don't really, I like lecturing and I like talking. Uh, I get that from my mom, but there are these wonderful moments that happen after my lecture where someone will open up about something that they've never opened up about. They will feel like, I think that's the thing. Like maybe it's, it's a combination, right? So it's talking to people afterward because I've just been able somehow or another, I've been able to model that it's okay to talk about weirdness. You've provided like, a safe space for it. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm going to, I'm going to get up on stage and I'm going to say some of the weirdest fucking shit you've ever heard. I'm going to talk about fairies and gnomes. I'm going to talk about time travel and ghosts and robotic Bigfoot living in the moon, being a spaceship. Like I'm going to talk about anything and everything that's weird that comes into my brain in the hopes that after I'm done, someone, whether it's to me or someone else will feel open enough to say, I had this thing happen to me one time and that they've never been able to say before. Um, I, you know, I started, I did my first lecture in 90 and I spent, you know, I can't even tell you it's the first eight years, like paying to rent out rooms in libraries all across the country and drive all over the country to talk to six or seven people about weird stuff. Right. And, that's always been important to me because somewhere in some town right now that I don't know about, there's a 15 year old kid that I was at one time who is looking for someone to say it's okay to be weird. And it's important that people do little library lectures or lectures at their local bar. Yes. And like, I, I sometimes get really annoyed when it's like, well, I'm only going to do this event because it's this many people. It's like, no, you know, I've, I know I'm kind of digressing. Like I do, I've done, big, I've done big comic book conventions. Right. And if anybody's ever been to a comic book convention, you know, that Sunday afternoon is like the worst day to go because most of the guests have left. Like they had to catch their planes and fly away. I've gone to comic cons ever since they were at VFW halls, like down the street from me. And, you know, it was, you know, a tiny little convention. Sometimes Sunday at 6 PM is the only time a kid can get to a convention. Like yeah. someone should be there to see them, to hear them, to talk to them. Sometimes people can't go to a giant paranormal convention, but they can go to the local library and see someone do a lecture on local legends and ghosts. Like right. it's, 
it's as important as this huge, you know, we, oh, I've got a big reach. I can talk to all these people. Sometimes you just want to talk to the one kid that needs someone to say it's okay to be weird. Yeah. That. Oh. Yep. It's, it's true, though. I mean, yep. you think about it. It's I was lucky enough that my growing up, my mom was supportive of all the weird that I was. If she wasn't supportive, she was very quiet about her concern. Um, <clears throat> and to this day, you know, I'm 40 years old and I still I tell her about the show. She's so like so happy to watch it and loves getting into it. But you also have those other kids who like you look at some of these extremists on either side of anything like Harry Potter is the devil's work. You know, like right. to imagine mm -hmm. to be that shielded and guarded, if you're experiencing something, it has to be like just absolutely awful. And you don't think about that as often. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that that's a, a big thing with you. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, we do this weird thing as humans where, see, I think that I think that little kids are a really good doorway into supernatural magical stuff because mm -hmm. They have no fucking filter. They will go and talk to a tree for 30 minutes. Like yeah. they will. Yeah. The, the, they haven't the, been influenced by all the societal bullshit. Right. And we allow them because we're like, oh, they're little kids. Right. And but they're then, playing. You're pretending. And yeah. Yeah. And they're living, they're doing magic. Like I, I can't tell you how many little kids probably one or both of you, me included in this thing, like at some point when you were little, like went outside and balled up your fists and made it fucking rain or made the wind blow. Or I really do think that I live in Michigan. There have been many times when the masses of Michigan children have made us had a snow day. So we didn't have to go to school the next day. Like we, we forced <laughs> that magic into the world. And then you get older and people are like, all that stuff you've been doing for the first eight years of your life is fucking nonsense. You need to learn this math and stop talking about it and start playing sports. Like that yeah. mm -hmm. blows my mind because there are people who are like, but what about all that stuff I used to do when I used to be able to spin around in a circle and just laugh and talk to birds? Like, nope, that was put away child childish things. Like you're, you're right. growing up now. and now you get locked up for that. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it's all of that brilliance is labeled as just childish, and then they can mold you into what they want you to be. And it's it's really sad. Yeah, and then you grow up, you have to fight through all of that negativity to rediscover what you knew as a kid. That. Yeah. Like, yeah, like I'm going to collect these leaves in this rock because and like when you do that as a kid, like you're just filling your pockets with magical leaves and rocks, right? And then yeah. as you're an adult, you're an adult, you get back on the weird path and you're like, oh my God, that rock is cool. I'm going to put that in my pocket. Yes. And I <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my God. Um, okay, so I've been reading your book. Theoretical, Theoretical Weirdo. Are you holding it the right way up? People get confused with the cover. No, they do. Yes, I am. <laughs> oh, because you're you're an upside down tinny. Yes. <laughs> upside down tinny land. Um, and in one of the parts you were talking about earlier years, uh, when you were diving into the world of anomalistic phenomena and realizing that um you needed to know and learn about the ways in which you could be tricked into thinking that something could be paranormal or something when it wasn't. Could you tell us a bit about that and like what you had learned? Yeah, for sure. So after my death experiences and my recovery from it uh, is when I started college. And one of the things that I wanted to know, not only did I want to know about my death experience, I wanted to know how my brain worked. I wanted to know how my brain could be tricked, how I could be fooled, especially if I was going to be doing paranormal investigations. So the first thing that I did, which was the easiest to do, was I, I joined like the Society for American Magicians and the International Brotherhood of Magicians, and I became a magician. So mm -hmm. like learn magic tricks. The hand is faster than the eye. Like let's see if that's a real thing. And so learning magic. And then I started taking, you know, hypnosis classes and classes in neuro-linguistic programming, how can language influence me, how can language influence my brain. Then I started signing up for 
experiments at my college at Wayne State at the time. So let's do 20 hours in a flotation isolation tank. Like, what is that going to do to my brain? uh Let's do do 38 hours with no sleep and no micro sleeps, right? So how my Mm -hmm. brain will hallucinate on on that level. And I mean, some of those experiences were by far, like I've had a lot of weird paranormal stuff happen to me, but when it's solely like you're in this moment with your brain, there was one time I was in doing a flotation tank and I had started out doing, you know, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever. And then they kept pushing me to go further and further. And a lot of times when you get, when you do really long flotation isolation tank experiments, you sleep through most of it. Like you're just so relaxed Mm -hmm. and and it's fine. But there was one time I was floating in this, in this tank, I was doing a float and I started, I got this, thought about did I feed my cat and like it all happened so quickly but I was like did I feed my cat and then my next thought was John didn't feed me and then like the visualization that I had was of my living room but from the level of my cat's eyes right right and then I thought oh no 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 I'm the cat John is somewhere else and then I popped back into my body and I was like, oh, fuck. Did I just like connect mentally with my cat? Like, did I just no. yeah. astral project into my cat? And then like I came home and it was so weird because I came home because my cat spent like the rest of the day like doing, uh, obviously cats are already weird as it is. But my cat was <laughs> that, that day, my cat was just like, what happened to us? Like, yeah, it, 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 it seemed like he had had an experience. Did we do a you, trade you in space in the thing? Like. It was so weird. We talked about like astral projecting and, and you know becoming like part, but if we're all from the same thing, could it not just be technically you tapping into another part of your own self that that cat is also a part of? I mean, that's just where right. it is. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I tell people sometimes when I'm having discussions with my friends, whether at the bar or on podcasts or wherever, mm-hmm. is where I really am at in my journey. And you just mentioned a big part of it. Like, I really do think that uh, we are we are all just one thing in disguise, right? So I right now, it's just me talking to other aspects of me. And right. you're just talking to other aspects of you, but it's all just the one thing experiencing itself subjectively through different eyes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, why not tap into a cat, your cat's mind, especially if you have a bond with that animal or person? You know, if you're somehow... You know, Sheldrake, Rupert Sheldrake talks about morphic resonance in a resonant field, that there are people who are closely bonded and animals included in that. I mean, humans are animals. Uh, If you resonate better with certain people, is it easier to access their emotional state or their awareness? And I think that's a lot of where the empath side of things comes from, too, because I have a little bit of that. I mean, I'm in no way like claiming to be upper echelon whatever but when i do have it when that flashlight comes on for that split second it's like i get a rush of memories and feelings that aren't mine but i've experienced it through you know what i mean through that person and you think about that that vibrational thing and how our brains work it takes you know synapses and energy and electrical impulses to communicate with each other for you to have one cohesive thought why could we not be that on a bigger scale for the greater, you know, the bigger picture, I guess. Yeah. Right. And like I said, like we experience paranormal phenomena so much, whether it's through words or experiences, so much of it has become so common. We don't even take it as paranormal anymore. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me. We don't even take it as paranormal anymore. One of the things I talk about at my lectures, cause there will tend to be really a kind of sometimes hardcore disbelievers and cynics and skeptics is I'll say like, whether you're a skeptic or a cynic or not, every single person in the world at one time or another has walked into a location, bar, restaurant, friend's house, and within a quarter of a millisecond, you walk in and you go, this place sucks. Like you you have no time to look around. You have no time to gauge the situation. You're walking up to the front door and you're like, I, this fucking, I hate this place. Or yeah. it's going to be yeah. great. Like you just know it. You have this intuitive again, like it's a resonant energy that we all experience. And we, 
you meet someone for the first time, you're like, I love this person. Like as soon as you meet them, you're like, I love them. Or you're like, that person's a dick. Like, you know it immediately. Right. <laughs> and, and that happens so commonly. We're like, yeah, it's just the way it is. But like I say in my lectures like too, when talking about, you're feeling stuff and yeah, you're feeling, you're feeling something. The universe yeah, is right. like letting those patterns interact. And when it comes to words too, I might've said this at my lecture in Wisconsin, Lindsay, when we talk about coincidences, like if a skeptic says something is a coincidence, the dictionary definition of a coincidence is seemingly unrelated events, which for no seemingly discernible reason seem to be related. What a fucking bullshit yes. definition. It means, it means <laughs> we have no idea why these things are connected. But skeptics will use that as a way to explain situations. Yeah. They'll say it's yeah. a coincidence. A coincidence means you just don't know why it happened. It's not an explanation. Yeah. It's yeah. a connection. Just like just like you can say a miracle is a miracle. Well, no, these fucking pieces fell into place and caused this end right. result. It's yeah. it's always funny that you usually see the skeptics that are, have a strong religious belief. And you kind of want to go, so you believe that this guy lived in a whale for three days and that this person turned into a pillar of salt, but yeah. someone imprinting energy on mm -hmm. on this surface is just crazy to you. Like that's right. that's where we are with this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just it's it's a lot. And just cope. thinking more about how how we are all connected when you were talking about that, um, it made me think of when I do Reiki for animals. Um I do it mostly for my dog um, and the little things with her that are just so cool. It's like, it's the only time when I can sit on the floor and she won't like be all in my face. Like I'll have my palms right side up on my knees and everything. And she'll just walk up and she'll touch her nose to the center of each palm. Like she knows what's happening. Yeah. And <laughs> the, when I'll be done, the way that she was positioned and laying down when I finished, wherever I find her in the house, that's how she's laying down. Mm -hmm. But this other time um, I had offered, I had been on this first date with this online date guy or whatever, and he had two dogs and one of the dogs had accidentally stepped on a shovel that was in the snow and hurt its paw. And so I just said, I can do some Reiki for your dog if you want. And he's like, fine. And um, so that was the first time I've ever included an animal that I wasn't familiar with. And uh, I, the usually set up some place in your mind that you go to. And the place that I go to, it's on a beach. And I just thought Frisbee for a beach or something for whatever reason and this dog just was not having it not excited about the frisbee at all so then i threw in i don't know if you've seen videos of dogs there's some contraption that dogs can load the ball in themselves and then they'll throw yeah. it yep. so i put one of those out on the sand and he went ape shit. absolutely loved it <laughs> and so i was kind of like well that's kind of goofy and after I did it, I asked him, I'm like, does that dog just like hate Frisbees, but love chasing my after balls? And he's like, oh yeah, absolutely. My other dog is the Frisbee dog. And I was, it's That's not awesome. that big of a thing, but it was enough to be but like, it's a, yeah, it's still yeah. like, what? <laughs> yeah. And, and to your point, like about the interconnectedness of stuff again, something I talk about in my lectures, like animals do Reiki to us all the time. Anybody that's ever had it, anybody that's ever had an animal, when you've had a really fucked up shitty day, like you come home, if you have a dog, like your dog knows you've had a shitty day and will come over and touch you and put its paw on you or put its head on your lap. Mm -hmm. Like it, it understands that you're not having a good day, even to the point of like your shitty cat that never like shows you affection. <laughs> We'll yeah. jump up on the back of your. We'll jump up on the back of your chair and slightly put a paw on your shoulder, and you're like, "I get it, buddy." I'm you here know. for you. <laughs> yeah, I've got one of those, and we've been celebrating her wins lately. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's been. Oh my god. Yeah. Hey, so I, I have a random one for you here. Um, we talked about this before we came on the show, but oh. there's a there's a story about you, um, kind of 
uh, playing a very successful mind game with the FBI. As oh yeah, to two missing soldiers. Yeah, so it's it encompasses both the FBI, the Air Force, the Department of Justice, and the Pentagon. So in the 1950s, in that's the upper, yeah, that's well, all. That's it. <laughs> In the Upper Peninsula of Michigan in the 1950s, there was a UFO sighting, and the radar station in Kinross, Michigan, saw this UFO coming across Lake Superior, so they scrambled a jet and set the jet up, set the, sent the jet up to intercept it. Well, the jet disappeared, and the UFO disappeared, too. And so there was, like, some search and rescue done, and they didn't find any wreckage. They didn't find the soldiers, the plane, nothing. And so in the 90s... I started reading books about this type of this incident and I noticed that they had misspelled in a bunch of different books. They had misspelled one of the pilots names wrong. Uh, his name was Robert Wilson, but people were calling him for some reason, RR R. Wilson. Uh, and that really made me mad. Cause I was like, we're researchers. The least we can do, especially for military men who just died in service or disappeared in service is get their names, right? Like that's it. The, the at a minimum, we should be able to get someone yeah. name. Right. So there were only maybe 20 pages of documents that the government had ever released on the Kinross disappearance. And so I filed a FOIA request, a freedom of information act request for them. And I got those 25 pages, which had already been released but one of those pages was the cover page for a report that said that there were like 500 pages of documents. And I was like, oh, so where are all those? So I started sending out Freedom of Information Act requests for these 500 pages. And, oh, we don't have them. We don't have them. We don't have them. And they, I kept getting denied over and over again. And this was making me super mad because in the interim, I had learned that since the government never found the pilots, they never listed them as like killed in action or the end result was that the families never got any survivor benefits from the government. And that really lit a fire under my ass. Cause I was like, this is absolute bureaucratic nonsense. That, yeah. like, right. He's got a wife and kids and Robert they wouldn't was CIA or MIA. Like they found right. a loophole for both of them. Exactly. Yes. And so Robert was single. He was the radar operator who they were getting his name wrong. But Eugene, Gene Moncla, he had a, a wife and kids and they had never gotten any survivor benefits. So that this is now we're into about 96. I'd been doing this about five or six years. Still getting denied all these documents. So I sent a letter which to the FBI, which eventually got routed back to me. And they said, we don't have any, any more documents. We don't know where these files are. Don't worry. You know, we'll, we'll continue to look, but you're not going to get them. Like, it's just not going to happen. There were a lot of files destroyed in a flood in 1963, whatever. Yeah. So I called one of my friends, my mentor, Craig, and I said, how can I get these? Like they're fucking with me. And he was like, well, be punk rock, like fuck with them back. Like, <laughs> go crazy with them. Like just send them nonsense, make them mad until someone gives you the documents. So I wrote a letter, a freedom of information act request to the department of energy and the department of energy had nothing to do with Ken Ross whatsoever. There's no way the department of energy would have had these documents. And I wrote a letter to them, a FOIA request saying you were mentioned on page, you know, 16. Uh, so you should have copies of these documents. And the department of energy calls me back and they're like, we, why would we have been mentioned? I'm like, I don't know. You were. And they're like, okay, we looked. We don't have any of these documents. And I was like, well, you're mentioned, so you should have them. So a couple weeks goes by, and I get a call back from the Department of Energy. And very nice woman on the phone. She goes, listen. She goes, I contacted the Air Force and the FBI, and I have a stack of 500 documents in front of me. I've looked through all of these pages. And we're not mentioned once anywhere in here. So I don't know what you're talking about. We don't have anything to send you. And I said to her, no, you need to read my FOIA request. My FOIA request was for any documents that you currently have or may come into possession of. And you just told me that you have 500 documents sitting in front of you. And there was just dead silence on the phone. <laughs> and like a week later, I get a box with 500 documents in it. All of the Kinross documents were released. 
We got the Moncla family all of their back benefits. We proved that the government didn't do as comprehensive a uh, search and rescue for them. So now, because of that document release and because of screwing the government and getting the documents finally, uh, if you go to uh, New Orleans, if you go to Louisiana, there's a little mm -hmm. grave marker for Felix Moncla Jr. that says, you know, in memory of Felix and Robert Wilson, who died protecting the United States from flying saucers from outer space. Jesus. I fucking love that story. I'm like, people have to hear this because it's so cool. Yeah. So that's what one researcher can do if you just put some time and energy effort into it. And again, like you don't solve any UFO mysteries, but you know what you do? You actually heal some old wounds, some, right. some family wounds, and 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 you recognize people's service and, and the things that they've done. And sometimes that's enough, right? Absolutely. And it's amazing that you're able to do it too. Yeah. I, I just love that. That's so cool. Oh, okay. So thinking about like um, when you were saying how you feel it's still so important to do those small libraries um, in small towns and everything, because there are those kids who don't have someone to talk to about things. Um I kind of grew up that way. I didn't find anyone in my town till I moved back home at 28 to find mm -hmm. someone to talk to. Um, but my question is, what advice do you have for people who want to learn more about like the paranormal or spiritual weird slash kinds of things? And, um, to how how to best sort through all of the information that's out there to find the things that are actually reliable sources because there's so much you know like i don't yeah, know yeah I, I really think that's the struggle like that just is continual right and mm -hmm. and i've always told people you're again w w when i talk about the, those energies of walking into a place and knowing that it's garbage or knowing that you like someone immediately we have an in inherent bullshit detector and i think we turn it off a lot of the times but like your bullshit detector is pretty good like it can it, it picks up on bullshit like that's we ignore uh, that because we want to for whatever given reason it's yeah. right but it's there and it's and it's i think it's probably an evolved process to keep us alive right so right. Yeah. like look for your bullshit triggers uh but for people who want to start the reality is for me most people do have access to a library and the smartest and craziest people ever have put their thoughts into books that are freely available at your library Mm -hmm. uh, you can go and sit in there for hours and just read them and put those thoughts in your head and you can start to mix them around into your own form and fashion. And honestly, I found so many people, uh, there weren't a lot of people in my hometown either that were into weird stuff, but, but seriously going to the library and, and looking at those books and checking them out. And then eventually like librarians were like, you should read this too. And then, Oh, do you know? So-and-so who also checks out these books. And then like all of a sudden you start to meet your little community. And also too, because of the internet and because of the ability to have so much information accessible to us, like if people want to investigate, you don't have to go to Waverly Hills. Like you can go in your backyard. You can go down the street. You can go stand outside an old building. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Uh, one of the things I wrote about in my book and, and I say at lectures, if we believe that ghosts and spirits are real, that everybody has the potentiality to become a ghost or a spirit, there have been a hundred billion deaths on this planet. So if let's say half, let's say half of the hundred billion people who have died uh, became ghosts. That's 50 billion ghosts that are on this planet right now. Now, human beings have only lived in a certain environmental area in certain habitable land spaces since there have been humans. So if you take the amount of habitable land space on the planet and you break down 50 billion ghosts per square acre, then potentially you have 11 ghosts per square acre, which means that 
which means that if you, which means that if you want to investigate a location, go out on your front lawn because there's at least two or three wandering around. <laughs> Statistically, True. True. there's four in your room with you right now. Not to freak exactly. you out, but yes. you want to go with stats. That's what we're looking at. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's a metric that I used to use, too, with, uh, with uh, structures. So, like, if your house is built, like, from – if your house was built present day to 1990, there is, like, a 10% chance that someone has died in your house, right? So, But if your house was built between 1950 and 1990 – that exponentially kind of pops to 30%. If your house was built between the 1900s and 1950, then you, you're you up into the 70th percentile of the chances of someone dying in your house. If your house is older than 100 years, then you start riding up into the mid to high 90s. Because, right. because pre-1900, we have to realize like hospitals didn't exist the way they exist now. Most doctors right. were practicing out of houses. Most mortuaries were in someone's house. Most people had parlors where they laid out their dead. Uh, the whole reason that a living room is called a living room is because architects were like, we can't call it the parlor anymore because it, people associate it with death. And so architects literally renamed the front room a living room to keep people from instead thinking of a about parlor. Dying, mm. Instead of a parlor, wow. right? So, I mean, I'm talking to you. My mother died in this room that I'm talking to you in. My mom died, mm. you know, a year and a half ago, right behind me. Yeah. Like, mm. so, like, yeah, if you, I mean, obviously people aren't comfortable investigating their houses. I understand that, but. You know, you can do secret investigations at your friends' houses. <laughs> <laughs> or talk true. them into it in general. Right? You're like, no, my house has nothing, dude. Your house is popping. Let's go over there. <laughs> Let's go over there. Your house is popping. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's oh true. God. I've never messed around in my house unless I've, you know, had a really, like a very significant need to. Mm -hmm. um, that That's one of the mm -hmm. things I've always kind of stood by is that, that – don't go fucking around in your house unless you have a really good reason to. Yeah. Just because yeah. it's your place, you know, it's your space. You don't want to open a door if you don't want to open a door. Yeah. So I have a, everybody, people know that I have what I call my force field over my house. I go to so many strange and weird locations that over every time I have a living space, a place that I live in, I create this kind of spiritual force field that things can't get into. Uh, it has this weird, result though and i tell people this all the time which is so like if i try and astral project if i'm in my house and i'll try and go out of body and astral project or do some magic to get out of my body mm -hmm. i usually just end up in my kitchen like i can't <laughs> just oh, bounce around really? and then, yeah like i can't get out of my own force field so it, like i've stopped astral projecting because i just end up in the family room like going yeah. big, big deal you're, yeah you're like, like i'm finding your oh <laughs> yeah, whatever no, man, that's just going to be the tinny fire drill. That's how you make sure your shit's still working. I'm going to yep. try this tonight. If I end up in the kitchen or the parlor, right. then, uh, then I'll know it's working. I've never <laughs> even considered something like that. I have a crystal grid around uh -huh. our house. That's something I've never even thought of. That's hilarious. Well, that's, a, I'll see people say like, oh, John Tenney, I saw you in a dream last night. Were you in my dream? And I was like, no, I was at my house. I can't get out of my house at night. Like <laughs> if I show up in one of your dreams and I'm like traveling, that's possible because I'm probably in a hotel. And so I can probably pop out and get somewhere else. But if you saw me in a dream while I was at home, it wasn't me because I was <laughs> in my house. Because <laughs> I'm not getting out of here. Oh my okay. God, that's hilarious. We're about to test something on you. All right. Yes. First time we've ever done this before. Okay. Um, basically, the way this is going to work is we're gonna we're gonna throw four random topics at you with a forty five second timer, and just right. have you go stream of consciousness, whatever you want to say about it. But we're gonna get you prepped for it with this. I love that graphic. Was so that much. okay? It was great. 
I love I made it. that last night. We had this idea, and I was like, "It's the best." I, I love I it. What to do? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I told so, him you would love it. I'm I, like, dude, I you it. love it. That is my uh, special needs cat on there too. So love it. All right. Yep. Here we What's go your cat's name? That one is Katie. Katie. He's mm -hmm. got a small herd. Yeah, I do. I do. All right. <laughs> 45 seconds is about to start now. The first one is color photography. Mm, color photography. Um, I like photography. I like color photography. I wish that someone uh, would allow the networks to have one of the $150,000 color night vision cameras to do ghost investigation with so that we didn't have to look at things in green IR light anymore. Mm. But how would that do with, with the way you shoot things in black and white constantly? Uh, how would you know the difference? Uh, you know, I, I like black and white, but that's just because I hate photographs of myself. I like color photographs of myself in the past, like looking at me as a little kid because they have that right. orange tinge on them. But I feel like black and white now is, is good because it kind of makes me look like an old movie. <laughs> so Pete, Pete, Boobs and horror. Uh, the reason this I mean, came up is because I saw a blog post about it. Uh, I mean, there's a part of me because I grew up, uh, you know, as a seventies kid where I don't, I, I think that, you know, to have an actual horror slasher film, there's gotta be boobs in the movie for some reason. Right. Like whether it's Friday the 13th or Halloween, like maybe some boobs. Uh, I don't even think that the way that I am personally, I don't even care if they're man boobs. I just think that boobs have to be in there somehow or another, even a painting in the, the background. Nipple. That's fine. <laughs> I'll, like an oil painted nipple is fine too. Yeah. There yeah. has to be some areola action or it's not a horror movie. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh my God. Jeez. Oh man. Well, we've got two seconds. So I'm just going to go ahead with. Uh... <laughs> this is so professional. Blue Thunder. Oh, God damn it, Blue Thunder. <laughs> I do it, Blue Thunder. God damn it, Blue Thunder. Yeah, I uh, went to a, a monster truck rally. First one I think I've been to in 35 years and had a lot way, lot, lot going for the, the truck Blue Thunder. And uh, Blue Thunder did not come through at the end. Uh, I was really depressed that uh, Gravedigger uh, blew a tire out on his first jump. I've been watching. Oh, no. I've been watching Gravedigger since I was, you know, nine years old. I was ready oh, for really? the Gravedigger. Blue Thunder was the one that got me most in character and the one I was most upset about. <laughs> the I'm, most, sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I'm nothing. This is, I can't tell you how many podcasts I've done. You, you're on the ball. Like, this is, <laughs> this is, I love it. Well, it's our last one. Let's see how we do. You ready? Yeah. Perfect possessions. Oh, perfect possessions. It doesn't get talked about a lot. It's people who want to be possessed. Um, people who, you know, we hear all the time, like the body kind of repels and people scream, but perfect possessions are the people who seem to be a little, maybe too nice and maybe getting ahead. Your bullshit calls it out. Uh, you can see people that might be successful who probably shouldn't be. Uh, I often wonder if those people are perfectly possessed, if they've made a little bit of a deal. Ah. I mean, like some crossroads bullshit. Yes. Mm. Mm, that could. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Do you honestly think that's a fun thing? I do. We kind of thought this up and I made all no, that I do. I, I think it's great. And he okay. literally came up with the little graphics and shit yesterday. It's so we good. We were just like, can we make this happen? Like, he's going to so be our guinea pig. So. I love it. I love it so much. You don't oh, even know. Good. Real quick, on real quick, my final thing. I have to have more seconds on perfect possessions. No, I want uh, you to, absolutely. I was going to say, 
that's fascinating. No, there's just this thing where, you know, we, I don't think the, where, where I'm at now, like, I really don't believe, like I could sit here for an hour and tell you, like, I want a demon to come into me. Like, it's not going to come into me. Like I, I have no want or actual need for it to happen. And everything that I've read, all the people I've talked to, all the experiences I've had, like to become possessed, you have to do some work to get possessed. Um, which is also why it's work to become unpossessed if you're going to be possessed. But I do think that there are people who have perhaps, like you said, crossroads, like made a deal. And I will tell you right now, and I, I've written about this before, like if you want to talk about actual demons, which, you know, the paranormal community love has a love hate relationship with oh, man, anybody yeah. that's making money off of you by selling you fear. That's demonic. Mm-hmm. Like if anyone that keeps themselves in a position of authority, anyone that profits off of your fear and your anxiety and your struggling, that, is a is is something that I think is truly demonic, um, and there are people like that in the community who have these very uh, light filled personas. But when you meet them, when you talk to them, when you really look at what they're doing, when you really look at their motivations, something just seems slightly off. And oh. why are they successful? Why is that working for them? And it doesn't make any sense. But if you think about it in the sense of perfect possessions, making deals, literally selling your soul for a dollar. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you, you don't have to sell your soul to a demon. You can sell your soul to a production company, to, uh, you know, a manufacturer. Like there are ways to become possessed that aren't necessarily spiritually demonic, but they do take on the qualities of demonry, which is profiting off fear and, and anger and sadness. Yeah. I don't think about it that way. It's more of the, um, that idea, that mindset and energy is Mm -hmm. what we have personified into demons in a sense. It's not so much a spiritual entity as it is us and our, the the capability we have to be horrible people. Yeah. Yeah. And sadly, that's how most things work. I mean, you just look at freaking advertising and commercials everything's if you don't have this car if you don't use this deodorant or if you don't do this like you're not going to get that person or have the house or whatever all of that all of yeah it. i yeah. use that deodorant and i'm alone with all my animals so it's bullshit <laughs> i'm just saying call them out hmm. lies <laughs> old spice is a fucking lie <laughs> Watch that be the the video before we come on to. You know what's really crazy too? Here's a little uh, hint of knowledge. Do you know what Florida water is? Yes. Yes. So Florida water, like cleansing for doing yeah. spiritual yeah. cleansing work and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, Old Spice is the monetization of Florida water. Florida water is what is Old really? Spice was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cinnamon, Dude, cardamom, rum. Crazy. Cinnamon carbon run. If you smell, if you smell Florida water and you like smell the original, ice, you can see exactly what they were doing. They marketed and monetized Florida water and turned it wow. into old ice. I literally have three bottles of it upstairs of <laughs> yep. Florida water. Yep. What? Give them to we, grandparents have, for Christmas. We have called them <laughs> out. <After> shave. <laughs> No, or you can just take Florida water. Scary. You can empty out the old spice. You can empty out the old spice from the bottle and put Florida water in. Most people yeah, won't even know. They say constantly. Oh my god, <laughs> John! Thank you so much for uh, yeah, joining us today. You. It was a blast. I could listen to you all day, man. I really could. Like just yep. picking your brain and and hearing things. It's there's some validation there, and then there's some new paths for me to kind of think about going down, and it's. I've got my night planned out now because of you. So <laughs> well, thanks, for having me. Been, exactly. thanks for having me. It's been fun. So yeah, much fun. It has been fun. And that's what I like. That's what I tell everybody like about you. I'm like, he's got one of the raddest minds that you would ever like. You could listen to him for however long and not. And, uh, 
I just want to say, like I say at the end of all my lectures, I'll say it here too, which is uh, don't believe anything that I've said. Uh, if you find some interest in something that I've said, research it, investigate it for yourself, find your truth, bring it back to me. Let's discuss it. Let's hash it out. Let's construct an idea that we couldn't have done by ourselves. And for all of the time, money, energy, and effort that we spend investigating paranormal phenomena, trying to explore and understand weirdos in some other realm of the universe, I implore people to spend at least half as much time, energy, and money exploring and creating connections with the weirdos that exist in this reality with them right now. Yes. On that note, you yes. guys have a great day. Thanks again for watching. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks.